In this video, I'm going to be talking about uh, trusses, but I'm going to build up to trusses and I'm going to talk about things like reactions. Um, I'm going to be do doing two learning intentions and success criteria. So here we've got our learning intention is to learn about the role of trusses, the different types of trusses, and the forces that act within their members. Success criteria. I can successfully, I don't know, but wait, wait, wait. Uh, justify the use of trusses and identify the different trust and identify different trusses. I can identify a trust member if it, um, it's intention, compression, or if it's a zero force member. I've got a couple of questions here as well. Why do we use trusses? What are the different types of trusses? We talked about that. Um, why is analyzing trusses relevant? What methods are we going to use? Uh, why do we calculate external forces first? Redundant members. We also we refer to them as zero force members. They're the same thing. Um, and then we're going to talk about where we use method of joints and method of sections. Okay, so I'm going to clear that away for a second. We'll just go to the blank screen. Okay, so the very first thing we need to do before we start anything else is, um, before we even can start talking about trusses, is we want to talk about reactions. Um, we'll maybe talk about the concept of members as well. So um, what they mean in terms of uh, maybe also the uh, assumed knowledge is forces. So at this point, we assume that you understand that forces F equals MA. Force equals mass times acceleration. There are lots of different kinds of forces. So um, in professional engineering, we talk about dead loads. We talk about live loads. Right, and then we have things like, um, so we have the self-weight, right? Uh, so mainly we talk about, say, the self-weight of the objects. We can have things like the furniture that's being applied or machinery, something like that. Uh, even, um, yeah, so let's say machinery. We can have the objects that are above it. So, if, for instance, if we have um, multiple floors of a house on top, we have to uh, include that. Those loads are not moving, so that we call them um, dead loads. Then we have live loads. Live loads allow for things like furniture, um, so there's, I don't know if it's true, but the story about some architect who designed, I guess it was probably a, a geotechnical engineer who, who made this mistake, but who designed a uh, library but didn't account for the weight of the books and the, book, uh, the library sunk into the ground, right? So furniture is, con is an important consideration. Also things like people, right? That's where we, we tend to think about that when we talk about live loads, but people moving around uh, if you have too many people, have a big party, say on a balcony, you could have the balcony collapse. So that's what we need to consider um, live loads. Now we just allow for what is a you know, what is an unlikely force. So we might say um, that we might we generally won't have more than two pe people per square meter on a balcony. So maybe there probably um, a time when that's a problem to say fireworks when everyone's standing out on the balcony and they're all watching the fireworks. That's when you can have a problem. Uh, another important load is wind loads. So we've discussed there's different kinds of loads that, and I've used the word force and load. So these forces are due to the mass of something multiplied by an acceleration. So in the case of dead loads, it's the mass of the concrete, the mass of um, the steel that's being applied. In the live loads, it's the mass of the people, it's the mass of the furniture multiplied usually by gravity. Right, so what we're usually looking for is our force is mass times gravity. Wind loads are probably the biggest exception where we're not usually multiplying by gravity. Wind loads can be very important. Wind loads can definitely destroy things. Um, and uh, yeah, so in that case, we're looking at the speed of the, of the wind. So things like cyclones can be particularly important. So forces um, are the first thing we have to understand. The next concept is we have members. Now members have lots of different meanings. But in this case, right, so we could say members are, are, you know, the people who make up a club is what we usually think of. But in this case, members, when we talk about an engineering case, uh, an engineering member uh, is, or a structural member is probably the more likely term, can include things like beams, columns, and uh, truss members. Now, uh, the truss members are the parts that make up a truss. They carry the loads on, on, that are acting on the truss. Uh, okay, so we need to understand forces. Then we have reactions. So when we learned, um, way back when we were learning about Newton's laws, we learned the second law, force equals mass times acceleration. Newton's third law is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's a very commonly used um, saying, you know, trope that we hear in physics. 
What that means is for structural engineers um, that if we're applying a force, there needs to be another force to counteract that. Otherwise, things are going to move. So um, in order for things to maintain their equilibrium, if I'm holding this eraser, in order for this eraser to not fall towards the floor, my hand has to push back up. That force that I'm providing is a reaction force. And in order, for, if I was applying more than the, the uh, mass times gravity of this eraser, my hand would be moving up into the air. So a reaction force will increase up to a point in order to balance out what we need and to keep things in equilibrium. So that's, why we, that's what makes it a reaction force and not just a regular force. So what we're going to calculate is we need to be able to understand that when we have our truss, that we're going to have um, some forces that are going to be counteracting the imposed forces, the dead loads, the live loads, the wind loads, in order to keep the truss in, the, in one spot. Otherwise, the truss might move or break, and both of those things are bad for structural engines. <coughs> so, um, excuse me. So that's how we're going to talk about reaction forces. Uh, Forces that um, keep that maintain the equilibrium. Now, <clears throat> if I just write those as concepts, we need to know about reactions. I'm going to, I use the term reactions, but what we actually mean is reaction forces maintain equilibrium. And equilibrium equal. means we can express that as the sum of all forces equal zero. That means that when we add up all the forces, that they're all balanced. For every vertical force, there's a horizontal force, uh, sorry, for every force up, there is a, for every amount up, there has to be the same amount down. For every <coughs> amount left, there has to be the same amount right. If there isn't that, and so oh, that would apply for diagonals, we'd just break that up. So we'd say, well, this has a certain amount up, and a certain amount down, a certain amount left, and a certain amount right. There's also, what we're going to talk about is turning forces, which we call moments. Now, um, if you've already done bending, you'd be familiar with moments. We talked about moment couples in year 11, but moments, moment forces, are pretty important, and moment forces are equal to M equals force times V, so moment equals force times perpendicular distance. So <clears throat> we often think about this in terms of leverage, that um, how much effort we take to uh, open the can of Milo, or in terms of a seesaw, that we understand that if we have 100, let's say 10 kilo weight, uh, or 10 kilo mass would be a 100 newton um, weight, and we have a, another 100 newton weight, those things will balance each other out. But we learnt before, we've already learnt that if we have one meter and two meters, that we can get away with half we can do this, we can balance this seesaw with half, <coughs> sorry, that should be Newton, with half the force, with half the weight, if we double the arm. And the reason for, for that is because the moment, the force, multiplied by the distance, the perpendicular distance, equals 100 Newton meters. And this also equals 100 Newton meters. And we can use a terminology, we can say this, uh, this is anti-clockwise, and this is clockwise. So, just like other vectors, moments, moment forces, have a direction, or they have a sense. They have either clockwise or anti-clockwise. So, what we need to have, in order to maintain equilibrium, we have to have the sum of the forces equal zero, and we have to have the sum of the moments have to equal zero. So, they're the fundamental concepts we're looking at to start off with. Okay, um... Once we've gone through that, I'm going to, now we've gone through that, I'm going to use the model that I brought in. Um, one of the other teachers welded this up for the year 10 class a couple of years ago. <clears throat> so, 
This trust here is a Warren Trust. And a couple of things we're gonna consider, but first of all, this Warren Trust, I'm holding, this Warren Trust has no external loads applied to it. The only load that is being applied to this, and it's actually quite heavy, is its own weight, its own mass multiplied by the, um, the force or, or the acceleration of gravity. That's the only force. The two reactions are my arms, so my hands are holding this thing up. If I didn't provide enough reaction force, it would fall towards the ground. If I provided too much force, it would cease to be reaction force, it would start to go up. Now, um, what we're gonna find, in order to be able to solve what's going on, and to find the forces in between, we have to know all the forces that are acting on it. That includes the reaction forces. So, um, that includes the reaction forces. So if I draw this as a model, this is a Warren truss, this kind of truss. It's a pretty common one. It's also a pretty simple one to understand. Um, geometrically. Um, my hands are providing a force up, and that's a reaction force. Now I don't know how much that weighs, um, for the sake of argument we'll say that it's got a mass down, a mass equal to 10 kilograms. Right? So therefore the weight, which is a type of force, equals mass times gravity, well force equals mass times acceleration, is going to equal, so the force is going to be 10 times, now we're gonna use gravity, the answer is actually 9.8, but we're gonna say it's close enough to 100 newtons. In engineering studies, we're allowed to use acceleration due to gravity. We're gonna say gravity is 9.81, or I think it's actually 9.806 something, um, meters per second squared, but we're allowed to use 10 meters per second squared in engineering studies, just to simplify our calculation. In practice, when you're working as a professional, you will use 9.8 because you can't afford to throw away 2% and um, that 2% of steel is a significant amount of money. Um, so, we're gonna, we're gonna replace that mass with our force because we're gonna assume, always assume that we're talking about Earth. We're not talking about Mars, Right, we're always going to be talking about Earth. And I think for most people it's pretty obvious, it, it's intuitive, that our reactions are going to be 50 and 50. Now, uh, at this point, most people, this is actually assumed knowledge. We should, you should be able to understand that that reaction is probably going to be equal. Now, what can be different though, is if I say, if I held this, or let's say there was an additional um, mass that was being applied here, for some reason, the, what, the, the mass of the object was um, uneven and it wasn't distributed equally. And in that case, I had the same truss, but now I applied the 100 newtons here. Well, what do we, have we got here? So here, what, we don't need to know the actual dimensions of my model. I'm gonna try and avoid, I'm gonna pick this up at least one more time, but. We don't need to know the actual dimensions of what this truss is, because as long as the thing is to scale, it doesn't matter, matter if we measure things in cubits, or in nanometers, or in feet, or inches, it doesn't matter what we use, what unit. So we're just gonna measure this in triangles. So we're gonna say, well, this is four triangles long, this truss. If it's four triangles long, we can say that the load, or the reaction, is probably gonna be uneven, if the, the weight is, is not distributed equally. So one of them is going to have 75 and one of them is going to have 25. Which side do you think is going to have which? Which side is going to have 75? Just point. Yeah, that's exactly right. The one closer is going to have 75 newtons, the other one's going to have 25 newtons. Right? That's right. Now, um, can you get the light up again? Um, now, the next one that's a little bit trickier, I'm going to, going to draw we, we have some calculations we can use, and we should be familiar with this. We, if you've already done bending, you'll have already seen this, but we're gonna use this phrase. I'm gonna make that a little bit clearer because sometimes people don't understand. This is a sigma. That's the Greek letter for sum of. The sum of the moments about any location, doesn't matter where we measure, but we're gonna measure just from a point, let's say from here, x equals zero. We're saying in order to be, maintain equilibrium, what we're gonna say here is that, remember, m, equals force times perpendicular distance. That perpendicular distance is pretty, pretty important. 
Okay, so force times perpendicular distance. What we have here is um, we have a force of 100. So actually we have um, a few forces. Um, now what I do tend to use is I tend to use green to say things that you don't need to do. So what we technically have is we have 75 times zero and then we have 100 times one triangle. I'll add a little triangle. And then we have 25 times four. And I'll include my little triangle. Now, we don't need to include the triangle part. The triangle will just, it will disappear in the wash. So that's fine. But what we're looking at here is we can use this maths and we can calculate that our answer is going to be that this, this will equal out. So first of all, I've written minus for these signs. I urge you to do minus, but always make sure you go and check them. So we've said clockwise is positive. That's what the convention that I, I always use in my class is clockwise is positive. Um, <clears throat> there is no standard. So when I was at uni, some, some professors would use clockwise, some would use anti-clockwise, some textbooks. In the same textbook, you'll see both. The HSC has used both. I just decided when I started teaching, the clockwise was always going to be positive. So what we're going to do is we're going to put our finger on the location we're measuring from X and I'm going to spin this force. And when I apply this force, it will turn my object. Like you know, I'm spinning the, a big spinning wheel or like a chocolate wheel or I'm doing, playing Wheel of Fortune. And I go, da -da 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 And that object is going clockwise or anti-clockwise? Clockwise. So it's going to be positive. This arrow, I've made an assumption that this arrow is going to go up, or I've, I've labeled my forces, but we're just checking here. If this is going up, da -da 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 around about x, measuring from our position of x, this is anti-clockwise. So it's going to stay negative. This one's zero, so it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. Now, a lot of textbooks ignore this force. I, I, you know, I understand you want to save ink, right? So, you know, a very, you've got a lot of time, you don't have much time and writing this takes time. But I find that by not writing the 75, it confuses kids. So what we're multiplying here, the distance to zero from X. Well, if we turn the spinning wheel, it's going straight through. It's not going clockwise or anti-clockwise. It's going straight through. So it has no leverage. It doesn't apply any turning moment. So it's zero. Now what we find is if we simplify that, and I'm worried I'm going to run out of the board, so I'm just going to write it over here. That simplifies to, uh, you know what, I'm going to write it just below. Hopefully it's still okay. This is going to be 4 times 25 is 100. We're going to bring it over to this side of the equation, so I'm just going to say plus 100, plus 100, and what we're going to see is 100 equals 100, so therefore, our, our assumption was correct. Right, we made this assumption. And the thing is, our intuition about reactions, right, our reactions here, is pretty simple. Right? Our interaction with, with, with um, this actually applies, and this is really all we're doing with that maths. But where it gets a little bit more complicated is when we start having, imagine these are 45 degrees. Right? This is a different kind of truss. Right? So we, we talked about a Warren truss, right? We're going to talk about Pratt and Howe trusses in a second. But for the moment, let's say that in this case, all we had was this force and our forces here. Now, in order to balance our horizontal forces, we said that the sum of all forces, in order to be in equilibrium, now, for a, st a structural engineer, everything is in equilibrium. If it's not in equilibrium, it's broken. Right? For civil engineers, uh, water can be, uh, that's allowed to move. For mechanical engineers, lots of things are allowed to move. But for a structural engineer, if it's moving, it's broken. Right? So it can't be moving, so it means it has to be in equilibrium, which means that for every force, there has to be a force that balances. So if I have, let's, let's go with 100 newtons again. If I have 100 newtons being applied here, now what direction is that going? That's going to the right. Well, there's going to have to be another force on one of these reactions that's going to the left like Beyonce. Now, the, that balances, <coughs> that gives us the sum, that's a sigma, the sum of our forces horizontally equals zero. I like to draw them as arrows like this. 
right? And just draw, it, it, uh, rather than writing out that whole big calculation, I just draw a little scale diagram, and that's that's for me that's good enough. Um, and I would be urging other markers, if I was involved in marking this question, I would be urging that that's sufficient working out to, to demonstrate. Um, now we're going to talk about reaction types when we go through the textbook. Only one of them can take the sideway motion, right? There's different kinds of reactions, but we're, we're trying to work pretty quickly at this point, so we're, we're not going to go into as much detail. Um, okay. But what we want to do here is, here, it's not, not as intuitive. What is the force that is required? What do we need here in order to balance this force? When we applied 100 newtons in the middle, it was easy. When we applied 100 newtons to the side, it was a little bit more complicated. But here is where we actually have to do, some, this is where we need that sum of the moments calculation that we saw a second ago. Because here, it's not intuitive what that value needs to be. Do you know what that value needs to be? No, okay, great guess, it's not 400, but it's, because remember, it's a long distance. A long distance needs less force. 25. Exactly right, 25 newtons is what it needs. Right, so 25 newtons is enough to balance that, because this is four times as far away as that. Right, intuitively that's what we're looking for. So if we have 25 newtons going up, what's the problem now? Um, nothing going down. Nothing going down, so this one here, in fact, has to be 25 going down. Now, often in our answers, we can write, so let's call this uh, the reaction on the, the left-hand side, right, the reaction L, and this is the reaction R. That's pretty common, common terminology. What we'd have to do is we'd have to say that reaction is actually going this way, and we'd use Pythagoras' theorem and trigonometry to figure that out. I'm not going to go through that now. I have spe um, separate videos where I talk about how to do trigonometry and how to use um, uh, Pythagoras' theorem, but you should be able to calculate those using tan and um, trigonometry. Okay, so with that, we now have the sort of the fundamental concepts of what we're talking about with reactions. <clears throat> um, yeah. Uh, let's, let's prove it. Let's, let's prove it. I'm not going to do the trigonometry. I'm going to say that, but what we're going to do is we're going to quickly prove this. So what we're going to do is we're going to say the sum. We're going to say clockwise. We're establishing our convention. I'm always going to use um, clockwise as positive. And then I'm going to say the sum. That's sigma. The Greek letter sigma, capital letter. It means the sum of all the moments measured from a location. Now in this case, <clears throat> we know before we get started. I said we're going to talk about different kinds of reactions. One of them is going to be more complicated than the others, all right? So we have pins and rollers. And rollers are simple, pins are more complicated. Rollers, they get pushed around. They can't stand up for themselves, so they can't, they can't provide a horizontal force. If you imagine someone a roller skate to give them a push, they can't push back. So if this is being pushed and we need something to push back, well, it's going to be the pin that's going to do that. How we draw that is we draw this one as a little triangle on wheels, on roller skates. This one we just draw uh, like that. Often we'll draw the ground below with these dashed, dashed lines. Um, I've named these as reaction left and reaction right. And now what I'm saying is we're going to apply a 100 newtons and this is going to be one side of the triangle, right? I'm going to actually include dimensions here. I'm going to say this is one metre. And I'm going to say that this is four meters, and that's one meter typical. Okay, so we're going to take moments about this location L. We're going to take moments about that point there. Moments about L equals zero. Now. What we're going to do is we're going to say how many forces are acting on this. I'm now going to replace this with black just so that we can differentiate it. How many forces are on this? Um, how many forces are acting on this truss? Four is actually right. I know it looks like three, right? One, two, three. But the pin, because we've got a horizontal force, is actually going to be going. There's going to be a sideways component. 
So if we uh, do, some, we don't know which angle it's going to be. If, if we know it's going to be somewhat this way, it might be up, might be down. We know that it's going to be down, but so it's actually going to be going. It's actually going to be going like this, but we don't know where that is at the moment. So we're just going to draw it like that as a squiggly line for the moment, yeah, to say that we don't know. Um, but we have four forces that we can we're going to use here. Uh, what we have is a vertical component and a horizontal component of L. Now, at this point, we don't really know that much, even though we've done a little practice. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to say is zero equals RL. Now, we can do it, break it as two parts. This is where I write RL times zero, and then we're going to have our force of 100 newtons. And I always write, my convention is I always write M equals force times D. The reason I do that is because often I need to do a little calculation and you often see people doing this thing where they'll do 5 times 4 plus 3 and it's like, well that's unnecessary. The brackets implies the times and for me that's a lot faster. That said, I've marked a lot of students' papers and um, I, you know, from other schools and I've not seen other people use that convention so I think I'm the only one who does that. So we're seeing 100 newtons multiplied by 1 metre. Now, at this point, we have to say, is it going clockwise or anti-clockwise? Clockwise, so we turn it into a plus. Minus RR4. Is it going clockwise or anti-clockwise? Anti-clockwise, so it stays a minus. Now, um, you'll notice we have two unknowns. But we get away with that unknown because of the magic of moments. This is why we use the moment equation. This is why we don't just do everything as... Um, intuition. The reason why we do that is because it allows us to figure out what to do when we have two unknowns. In this case, because we can multiply things by zero, anything multiplied by zero gets ignored. And that's why a lot of te teachers don't even bother to write that. I find it important to write that because by writing that, it establishes what's going on. The next thing is that I've said minus, and that's because I've made an assumption. So I'm writing assume up, therefore, anti-clockwise. So I've made an assumption. Now at the, end of our, uh, at the end of our calculation, if our answer is positive, it will mean my assumption was correct. If the answer is negative, it means my assumption was incorrect. I think that's a fundamental concept that people really struggle with. Okay, so what I can then simplify this as is I have 0 plus 100 minus 4 uh, Now I want to move that over. Most people are okay with that level of for R. For R, R equals 100. So therefore, R, R equals 100 divided by 4 equals 25. Which is what we calculated earlier, and our assumption was correct. So we can say here this was positive. Therefore, our assumption was correct, or okay. Therefore, now, you don't need to write anything there that's in green. The stuff that I write in green is just to help students because I've seen a lot of blank faces and it helps, it only needs to help two or three kids in your class to really, you know, make a big difference uh, to, to their outcomes. Okay, so that's how we're gonna calculate that reaction. Now, what we could also do is there's two ways we can find L. What we could do is what we saw earlier is we can say RL well, we know that there has to be, using the sum of the forces horizontally, it has to be 100 going this way. And we say if the sum of the forces vertically, if we have RR going up, we're going to have to have RLH, sorry, that's not H, V, sorry, V going down, in order to balance it. So if we have 25 up, RLV equals 25 down in order to maintain that equilibrium. And then from there we can do our trigonometry and our Pythagoras' theorem to calculate RL total. Um, that's the, the kind of the key focus of what we're going to be looking at just to find reactions. I don't really want to drive too much, much deeper than that. Um, at this point you, you should have that. By the time you're continuing to trust us, you really want to have a solid understanding of reactions. There's plenty to do. Um, reactions have been worth at least two marks in every single HSC. So often I'll have students who really start getting worried about, like, should I learn about cast iron, right? 
I would say if you can't solve reactions, don't worry about cast iron. Cast iron, statistically not going to be all that common. If people are talking about what does vanadium do in steel, don't worry. If you can't do reactions, you don't need to worry about that. Um, people who like flight instruments maybe, you know, would be an example of something, you know, maybe a little bit more esoteric. Uh, people not knowing the different kinds of copper. I'm trying to think of a non-material example. Um, this is really, really important. The only thing that's more likely to be in, in a exam than reactions, the only thing is threaded orthogonal sections. That's the only thing that's more likely to, because orthogonal drawings are always going to be worth three marks, right? This is the second most commonly asked question. And then trusses, are the third most commonly thing, commonly uh, asked question. Trusses have been in 18 out of the last 20 HSCs. So I say to the people, until you've understood truss trusses, you probably don't need to be worrying about too many other things. Um, <clears throat> to use a, a mechanical question, so people who are worried about gear ratios, don't worry about gear ratios until you can do trusses because this stuff is really important. Okay, so we've understood uh, reactions or at least we have a basic understanding of what's going on with your reactions. I'm not, this video is not intended to focus on reactions, it's intended to give an introduction to trusses, but we can't really do an introduction to trusses without doing, um, without starting, without having this first un, uh, uh, concept. Now this concept, this sort of approach, is actually really important in how we're going to tackle trusses anyway. Okay, so a quick point that we're going to talk about um, before we go on. This is where the magic of editing could have uh, saved us all some time. This truss that I've used as a model, this truss we can't solve, not at the HSC level. This truss is too difficult, and the reason for that is because it's a 3D truss. We in the HSC can only deal with coplanar or 2D trusses. If the forces are in an um, external 3D plane, we can't solve it. Also, there are statically determinate trusses and statically indeterminate trusses. This is 3D uni before you can, you can focus on anything that's in a 3D space. Even then I would say that that's probably beyond, um, beyond a graduate level understanding, 3D space. And I would say that um, statically determinant trusses. Basically, you start adding too many members into this thing. Uh, it can be you can actually get to a situation where it's too difficult to solve, at least at the HSC. Uh, we're going to talk about how we can approach those and how we can figure those out in a second, but for the moment that will do. Um, the other thing we're going to talk about is in the HSC, we're only interested in pin jointed trusses. This truss here, you can see that all the joints have been welded. They're fixed. There's no ability to rotate or move. Now, the reality is that when students make model trusses, they're very rarely going to use pin jointed trusses. Also, as you go a little bit further beyond that concept, there's the fact that there's nothing that's truly a pin or truly fixed. There's always some level of you know, gray in between, right? There's a ratio between zero and one. We're not worried about that. What we're gonna say is that for our purposes, we're going to treat everything as pinned because otherwise it's 30 union. We just, we have to start somewhere. So we're gonna have an abstraction. And the reality is, so we might have a picture of this as a crane and we're going to treat that, that crane as being pinned, even though that's not realistic. So, um, if we've used a single rivet in all of those joins, then we would be using a pin jointed truss, but it's much more difficult, and especially if you're making a model, we tend not to ever, I just don't want to drive, drive too deep into that. I just want to say that in HSC, we're only working to a certain point, and what we say is true to a certain point of view. It takes several years of understanding to really be more and more, uh, for our model to be more and more accurate. But for us, it'll do. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to, uh, let's go to the, the textbook, please. Okay, uh, <clears throat> go down. So we're using Copeland's um, Engineering Studies, the Definitive Guide, Volume 2. Uh, this is, I think, the third edition. Keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, truss analysis. Okay, so here we have a Warren truss. 
Like I said, this is the simplest concept. Now you'll notice that it is, a Warren truss is made up of triangles that are 60, 60, 60, right? That is very useful because what we will typically do, we will only, in, 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 I'm not saying always, but often we can save ourselves a little bit of time by understanding that if we, I'm just gonna get, tell you that, um, so I've memorized a small amount of trigonometry. I've said that if that is 100% and this is a 60-30 triangle, this will be 50%. So the long side of a 30-60 triangle is always double the side of the small side. Right? The long side is twice as big as the small side. The side in the middle is 86.6%. Now I remember that by talking about my friend Disco who's born in 1986 and I call it the Disco number. Right, it's just a shorthand that I use a lot. It works for me, maybe it doesn't work for you. The other number that we use is 45 degrees. If we have 100% here, we have 707. I you know, usually use some sort of reference to Boeing planes. Um, but yeah, 7.07, 7.7 7 .7 is, um, is the ratio there. I assume that people know that, or they can use a calculator to do that level of trigonometry. Very rarely we'll have numbers that are different, that aren't 60 and, 40, uh, 60 and 45, and we expect you to be able to use a calculator. But if you see these numbers, the DISCO number or 17.7, .7, that's where I've pulled that number out of the air from. So I want you to be aware of that. And that's gonna save a lot of time, especially if you're a teacher standing up on the board, that saves time. Okay, next. We're just going slowly. Okay, so we're gonna learn about reactions. So, Copeland has a five-step process to finding reactions. Uh, if we can zoom up, uh, keep no, 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 not zoom, keep scrolling is what I meant to say. That was, okay, so we're gonna draw a free body diagram. We're going to break our diagonals into vertical and horizontal components. We're gonna keep going. We're gonna take moments about the non-roller because the roller is simple. So we're gonna measure everything from the non-roller, right? If we keep going. Um, once we've found that reaction, we're going to use the sum of the forces vertically and the sum of the forces horizontally to find the, the, um, the pin, the non-roller. Then we're going to find the total reaction of the pin by using um, trigonometry and uh, Pythagoras' theorem. Now, there are four, three different kinds of reactions. Now, like I said before, nothing is truly a pin or fixed, right? It, in fact, it, it instead has a, fi a fixity value, a fixity coefficient between zero and one. But for the sake of us, we're going to use this terminology. This is what we use for the HSC, and this is totally fine for first year uni. Um, we have pin, a fixed. Fix will not matter at all for trusses. It's only for bending that we worry about uh, fixed. We can ignore that. We have pin or hinge, and we have rollers. So we've said here before that the roller, which is represented as this triangle on wheels, it can only push up. Or when I say up, not up, it can only push away from the, the reaction. So it can't push perpendicular to the reaction. So um, if we have a truss, sometimes we have show trusses that are on their side. So if we have trusses on their side like this, like a crane or something like that, let's say we had that, the roller can only push out from the wall. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if we have something on Sometimes we might have something like this. In this case, the roller can only push that way. Yeah, so that's what the roller can do. The roller can only push directly in the normal direction, so perpendicular to the surface that they're, they're rolling upon is probably the better way. Whereas on the other hand, the pin is more complicated. The pin can take perpendicular and parallel forces. Okay, so I think that's enough on reactions, at least for, for what we're talking about. We can keep going through the book. Yeah, it's fine, at that level it's fine, just zoom up. Okay, so Copeland's gonna give us an example of how to do this reaction. Um, I'm pretty sure I have a video where I've gone through this specific example, example 1.1, but what effectively what we're gonna do is we're gonna break this 30 into two parts. So we're gonna say this is 30 times Seven, uh, or 0 0.707 and this is going to be 30 times 0 0.707 now one of these two reactions is going to take the horizontal component which one okay so this one here it's not on roller skates so it can push back so it's going to push 
Now, um, I'm pretty sure that's 21.1 .1 or something like that. Uh, three times 0.7 is gonna be close enough to 21. Uh, it's 21 and a bit. So close enough that we're gonna say it's 21. And then what we're gonna say is, well, we have these amounts down. Now we could use that thing where we divide these up, but instead it's just easier if we use our sum of the moments equation where we say, this, so we said clockwise is positive. I'm always using it as so clockwise is positive. And then we're saying the sum, so it's a sigma, moments. Now, we Copeland has said that we should take moments about the non-roller, the pin. So A is the big pin. So we're taking moments about A equals zero. And then zero is, and then we just go through all of the forces. Now, we know that there's a reaction at A. That reaction at A is going to probably be something like this. We have R, A, and H. We have R, A. And we can make a reasonable assumption that R, A is going to be going up. But we don't know that. The same way that we make a reasonable assumption that R, B is going to go up. But we saw before it's possible to make an incorrect assumption and our answer will be negative. So rather than dividing this 50 into thirds and dividing this 30 or um, 30 times 0.7, so it's 21 or what, 21 and a bit into thirds, we can just use this one equation and then just that will give us an answer. And that's a much simple, it's much easier to read the answer if you do it this way. It's the way most people approach it. I just want to let you know that you can do it intuitively by just breaking it up into those parts. Now, I will write RA multiplied by zero, and that's how we get to ignore RA, is because the moment, the distance to the moment, distance to the reaction is zero, we can ignore that. We're then gonna multiply by 50. 50 times 10, that's going clockwise, so it's positive. We then have, we're gonna call this 21. 21 multiplied by, now in this case it's 10 plus 10. You see now I use the brackets and I use that factorizing, um, that factorized method, that's easier. Now I can just write 20 here. And then I've got minus RB vertical times, <coughs> sorry, brackets, three times 10, which is 30. Now, because I'm a completionist, because I like to add, add everything, I would also add that we also have 21 multiplied by zero. We have still this horizontal force, but we ignore it. And the reason why we ignore it is because it's passing through A. That horizontal force is passing through A, so we ignore it. Now, some people won't write that down. And by not writing it down, people will say, well, there's this force there, why did you ignore that? And so I think it's much better to write it down so that way you're communicating clearly that these things are going to be eliminated. They're not being ignored. They're eliminated because their perpendicular distance is zero. Okay, um, now I'm not gonna go through that calculation because Copeland's already done that and I think I've got a video somewhere else where I've already talked about that. Okay, scroll up. Okay, so here we can see Copeland doing that calculation. Now, you can see Copeland has done 50 times 10. He's done 30 sine 45, which is the 21 or something, times 20. He hasn't done the 30 sine, the 30 cos 45 multiplied by zero. Now, that can be a point of confusion for students, right? Um, but then after that, it's simple algebra and it, and, uh, it continues. Then uh, Copeland in step four has used the sum of the forces vertically and horizontally to determine the values of the pin and then we can keep going up. We're using Pythagoras' theorem and trigonometry to find uh, the, the combined value of the pinned reaction at A. And we get our answer. Okay, so that gets us, gets us reactions. Okay, well, let's keep going. Now, once we get to these trusses, I have videos where I go through how to solve the trusses in the textbook for 1.1 and, and so on. I then have a couple of past HSC questions where I go through those and I've gone through every truss in the HSC or I've gone through 20 um, trusses in the HSC where I've gone through those. Um, Ami al Haj has also done videos going through several, you can go through um, other ones on the internet, but I think that, can, that gives a good understanding of how to approach those. Um, now, what did I say that I was going to work on? Um, oh, 
Okay, can we go to the Google Doc? So I'm not going to go through any more examples. Instead, I'm going to go through trust theory. So what we said we're going to learn about is why are trusses used? So the reason why we use trusses is we could just use beams. So if you've already done bending, this, uh, you'll understand what a beam is. But typically when we talk about beams and columns, what the difference is, is that typically a beam is the term used for a structural member that supports perpendicular loads. So that would be a simple beam, right? But we can have more complicated beams that have uniformly distributed loads and things like that. A column typically takes loads through its axis, along its axis. Right, so we call those axial forces. The two axial forces are tension and compression. I should also say, so beams deal with bending and shear, and columns, axial forces, which are tension and compression. Now, <coughs> Um, when we're talking about trusses, well, the problem is that with a beam, as a beam gets longer, it gets less and less capable of being able to deal with, um, with bending. So the same force, the same force, as a beam gets longer, it's more and more likely to bend, to bend or buckle. Um, there's lots of examples we can see with this, where if we have, say, a metal ruler, it can support itself when the span is small, but as the, the span gets longer and longer, eventually it stops being able to support itself and it collapses. Um, that's the problem with bending, is that as the distance increases, we're gonna have a, um, the, the ability to support it as a, an inverse square law. So it gets worse and worse as it gets longer. Uh, and not just proportionally, but um, exponentially. So, what we instead can do is, uh, one other point I'll, I'll talk about, is when we're talking about beams, if you've studied beams already, you'll understand that beams, we don't lie, when you're building a house, for instance, you don't apply, lie the bearers this way, you instead apply the bearers this way, right? You, you, you don't lay them flat, you, you stand them vertically. Now the reason for that, I remember when I was you know, first doing construction and when I, um, I asked, wouldn't it be easier to put the use the nail gun if we just laid them flat? What is the advantage What is the advantage of standing them up? Now the fact is that we know that with stress, stress equals force over area. And that's an important concept for, for trusses. But for flexible, um, for bending, right, we know that the bending stress equals my over I. So instead of using R over area, we're using this value I. And that I increases as the depth increases. That's the short value, the short point. And again, it doesn't just increase, it increases exponentially. So as it gets taller, it gets stronger and stronger, much stronger than if it gets wider. If it gets wider, it just increases proportionally. As it gets taller, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger until eventually it starts to risks collapsing. Um, that's, the, that's the reason why we stand these up, is that the depth is important. Now, when we say the depth, we're talking about relative to the direction that we're applying the force. We live um, on Earth where we're dealing with gravity, so I is opposite to the direction of the weight that's being applied to these things. Now, the idea is, I said that we can make them taller and taller and taller, and I've heard, I don't know if this is a myth, but I've heard that people used to take steel sections and cut them and then join them. I believe this is called um, castellized beams or something like that. But the idea is you would join them and you'd get this shape here. Now, the, when I heard this, I always thought, well, why wouldn't you just cut out circles? Make the beam the size that it's supposed to be and then just cut out circles. But you see how you could take those two pieces of steel and then put them together? You'd actually have one piece that's a little bit off-center, right? But um, you would be able to get a beam that um, you, you can make it taller. And if you make it taller, it doesn't matter that there's gaps in the middle. Now again, I don't, I'm not doing the bending, uh, I'm not talking about bending in this video, so 
why you can have, uh, allow to have gaps in the middle is not really what I'm going to go into now. But the point is, we often see this, right? With um, I can think at Railway Square, um, they have staunchions that hold up the uh, supports for their roof, and they have these circles that have been, I guess, laser cut out of the steel. There's a certain point where you can say, well, isn't that what a truss is? It's just where you've taken the beam and you've made it really, really tall with really, really big gaps. So that's one consideration. The second thing is that a truss is a way of a, a truss is a way with, of dealing with perpendicular forces. So if I have this perpendicular force here, let's say I have a, a, um, a bridge and I have a big force in the middle that I need to support and I don't like bending. I want to avoid bending. Well, trusses, what they do is they don't deal with bending. Instead, trusses convert the bending force into axial forces and axial forces are more cost effective. So that's the big reason. Why do we use trusses? The answer, why do we use trusses? We use trusses because they um, eliminate bending and they're more efficient. Because we're dealing with axial forces, we, couldn't, we can get away with using less material. Less material, material reduces the cost, allows us to build more trusses. Um, <coughs> so, they're the two reasons um, that we're gonna focus on. Okay, so, we're dealing with axial forces. The next point I wanna talk about, just quickly, because there's not a question on this, is when we're dealing with a um, truss, I should have used that one here, but I just got eliminated. The space seems off, that'll do. Okay, you can never apply a force mid span. All of your forces have to be applied to the node, right? They have to be to where they join. You can never, because if you apply the, the piece here, what will happen is you'll get bending. And if you get bending, the thing is not designed to deal with bending and it will break. It can't distribute the loads if you apply it to the mid-span. And that is a common way that when kids make their models, this is one of the ways that they break them. is because the force is not being applied to the node where the, things, where the, the pieces meet, the joint. Instead, it's being applied mid-span. And if it's being applied to the mid-span of the member, then it's going to uh, fail. So that's, that's worth mentioning. Okay. What are the different types of trusses commonly used? So we're gonna go down. Okay, uh, uh, types of trusses. Okay, so if we go to Garrett, um, Garrett's Bridges, we already talked about Warren Trusses, we can skip that. Warren Truss was an Australian politician. Um, I don't know if he's around, he's certainly not active. But can we just open in a new tab, these three? Um, there are lots of different trusses, but I always just like to focus on these four. So we've talked about Warren Trusses, K trusses are very complicated. They have a lot of members. Um, I, you don't see them being used very often. There are examples of K trusses out in the wild, but they're not very common just because of the high maintenance costs. Okay, so then we have Pratt and Howe. So Howe, a Howe truss, the ends of the truss look like this. You know, usually symmetrical. One of the things, Garrett is, uh, anyone who does a bridge model as one of their assessment tasks should look at um, Garrett's Trust um, website because it has some good advice. And one of the things he says is that if your bridge is not symmetrical, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, you're gonna have torsion, and we don't even talk about torsion in the HSC course. Okay, and then we've got Pratt. Now Pratt looks similar, but Pratt, we can see that What we have is, I always think of the Deadly Hollows um, symbol. I don't know if you're any Harry Potter fans, uh, but that's the Deadly Hollows symbol. For the Pratt Trust, you have two of these. Deathly Hollows? I don't know, Deathly Hollows, whatever. Anyway, whatever it is. <clears throat> um, for Pratt, we have two of them on the sides, right? one on each side, whereas for Howe, it's in the center. Um, now, how you remember that? I don't know. You could think that there's two prats, or the prats are on the edge, like a prat being an annoying person, you know, a bit of a prat. 
Anyway, um, how that works for you, I mean, I've never seen a question that asks you to identify that. There was a question a while back asking you about Allen trusses in the HSC. Um, most people I spoke to thought that that was a bit of a harsh question. So um, I wouldn't expect you to know anything other than um, a Pratt and how, and to be honest, it's not really something that I've committed a lot of memory to. Um, we live near Tom Uglies Bridge, and I'm pretty sure that's a Pratt Truss. Uh, if we go back to the videos, yep. Uh, go down, go down all the way through these ones. Uh, here we go, introduction to trusses. Now this will not have sound, or it will make a terrible sound when we click on it. Okay, um, so Peter Thieu has, what is a truss, why is it used? Is Tom Uglies a Pratt Truss? So here we can see that it's close enough. We have that shape there on the edge. Okay. You can um, check out his video for more detail. Okay, let's go back. Um, okay, so back up to the top. Back to the questions, the dot ones. Okay, why is analyzing trusses relevant? Okay, so the next thing we need to do is that it's one thing to know the external forces on the truss, but in order to be able to design a truss, we need to be able to figure out where the forces and how the forces, uh, where the forces are and how they're being uh, distributed. So the, actually, I'm going to go back, go back down again. Um, sorry, up, 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 uh, up, up. Let's open Warren Trust, please. Okay, so there is a great resource called the Johns Hopkins Trust Simulator, right? If you just type in JHU, because Johns Hopkins University, and then type in Trust, you'll be able to find it. And then scroll down a little bit just to here. Uh, let's see if we can go. Let's see if we can see a whole picture. No. Okay, let's go to uh, the prep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Now, uh, can we zoom in a little bit on that? Okay. So what we can see here is this truss is supporting a 100 newton load in the center. We can spread out the load, and that's a little bit more realistic, but we're going to focus on just a nice, easy abstraction. What we can see here is that the forces being applied in this truss are not equal. For starters, we have these ones here that are zero. Right? They're zero. Why are they there? Why would we waste money paying for steel to build this, this section that doesn't do anything? Well, there's a couple of reasons, but we can see that there is an uneven, uh, uneven or an inequal, inequal um, distribution. We can see that for the 100 units being applied, you can see 100, 100, 100, and here we can see 30, 30, 30, right? So it's much less, there's zero here, 100% here, and here we can see less here than there. Now, that's part of the design. That's part of what it is. The K truss has a more equal um, distribution, and that's what we're looking for. But it's all, all a trade-off. What we want is an equal distribution of load but without increasing the mass of the truss, because if we increase the mass of the truss, we're going to be paying for more steel. And no one wants to pay for it. You know, we want to pay for as little steel as possible. I always say anyone can build a bridge, but it takes an engineer to build the cheapest bridge possible. Because if we build a cheap bridge, then we can get two bridges. And you know, two bridges is better than one. So what we're looking at here is we want to find which part of this truss is most likely to break. Which part of this truss is most likely to break? Um, the 100 or the zero? Great, okay, the 100 is where it's most likely to break, it's exactly right. So here, this member, no force is being applied at all to that member, right there. Zero force is being applied there. Whereas this member here is doing heaps of work, right? It's taking all of that load, taking 100 newtons of load. So what we can do by understanding the truss, we can design the truss to either evenly distributed loads, we can choose a design that is going to have very equal distribution of load, or what we can do is we can double the thickness of that member and then reduce the stress. If we reduce the stress, the strength will be greater than the stress and it won't fail. That's way back to like our first term of uh, notes where we talk about the difference between strength and stress. But ultimately, this force is going to be divided by the area, it's going to produce a stress and if it's over 300 megapascals, the strength of steel is 300 megapascals. If it's over 300, we, do, we have to do something. So what can we do? We can redesign, or we can use stronger steel, which we never want to do, or we can just apply more steel. We can just add an extra thickness of steel to increase the area. 
So that's, there are options when we look at and, and do analysis of the trust. Okay, so let's go back to here, please. Up the tops of the dots. So why do we do the analysis? We do the analysis to design um, efficient trusses and to be able to select materials and sections, so how much material, in order to make sure that the truss is gonna be strong enough and not break. We might even do a calculation, we might say, oh, if you wanna build a space elevator, oh, we don't have materials that are strong enough that we could ever make, uh, that we can make a space elevator with our current technology. Um, okay, what materials, what methods for calculating forces in the truss members are used? Okay, <clears throat> there are two methods that we use. There's method of joints and method of sections. I lean very, very, very heavily into method of sections. There are times and uh, times where method of joints is useful, but I typically say that you don't want to use method of joints. Um, okay, why are external forces calculated prior to member analysis? If you don't know the external forces, you can't calculate. You need to know all the external forces in order to get your trust simulator to work. So part of that, the trust simulator can calculate the reactions for you. It does do that for you, but it does that step before it does the analysis. Okay, uh, what is a redundant member and why might it be present? So when we looked at that prep truss earlier, we said, why would they have a zero force member? We, remember we saw that the, we said the side of a prep truss looks like this. And I drew a zero there, right? To make the deathly hollows, 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 I think it's hollows. Anyway, <clears throat> so why is that there if it's a big fat zero? Couple of reasons. When the truck drives onto the, onto the truss, it's not a zero. The other reason is, if you didn't have it, this section here would be much more likely to fail, right, through something called buckling, right? So buckling is a problem that if something is being squashed, um, if you take a straw, back when you were allowed to have straws, but um, if you have a, con a, a, a cardboard tube, right, big cardboard tubes, and you squeeze it down, even though it's strong enough to not be squashed when you take your cardboard tube and squash it down, if you have a really long cardboard tube, let's say like the wrapping tube for, you know, the tube for wrapping paper, if you squeeze on that, even just a little bit of um, asymmetry and it will collapse. And it won't collapse downwards, it will bend. And then when it bends, it breaks. So that's what we wanna do. We wanna avoid that bending or buckling, right? And so that's why compression is riskier than tension. So all things being equal, the, the problem with tension is tension um, doesn't deal with holes. When you drill bolt holes, all of those bolt holes are points of weakness for tension. They're not a point of weakness for compression. That's a little bit of a, a um, extra bonus piece of information for you. I'm likely to get that in the HSC level, but you know, I've seen questions like that, especially in independent trials. Okay, <clears throat> why are external loss, okay, we're in, so they're called redundant members or zero force members. Okay, so we're gonna do um, some effort on zero force members down in a second. Explain when the method of joints would be an appropriate method to calculate the force in a truss member. Okay, so method of joints is useful, it has its place. Oh, I have a video, this is my video, but um, yeah, we don't need to see Snoop Dogg. Um, we can close that, yeah. No, we don't need that, thanks. Okay, <laughs> explain when um, method of joints is useful. Method of joints is useful when we have two situations. When we're talking about something that's on a corner, so if the load is being applied, if we're talking about find this member here, this one here, or this one here, and the force is being applied from the top, then it can be useful if we have a simple load condition to use method of joints. That's the first time. I would say that it's just as fast to use method of sections, then you should use that. Um, the second time, the other time when it's useful to use method of joints, is when you've been asked to solve the entire truss. If you've been asked to solve the entire truss, then that's when it's useful. K trusses are quite difficult to solve um, by hand, and I have a video dedicated to K trusses, just using an example and saying how I solve a K truss. That's really the high order um, solution. Okay, so, method of joints. We have to solve everything, or you have to solve a corner. Now. Last year, so in the 2021 paper, they asked you explicitly to use the method of joints to solve the trust. Now, um, I don't want to go on record as saying whether or not you did or didn't get marks for that. I can say that um, in 2022, 
there would, you definitely could lose marks if you didn't use a graphical solution for a vector cropper question. So I would say these days, um, well, first of all, I, I think it's worth addressing. So what do you do if you have a question that says use method of joints and you have no idea how to use method of joints? What I would say is use the method you know and get some marks. That I cannot stress that enough. And so the same way that if they say use a uh, graphical solution to find this vector and you don't know how to do that and you don't know how to use the analytical method that, um, by doing calculation, get some marks. Absolutely, you should be going and getting some marks. You might be penalised one mark but better be penalised one mark than get no marks. Now, definitely, I think that it is worthwhile for students who are looking for band six to be able to understand method of joints and method of section. But from this point on, I'm only going to be talking about method of sections. I have a video where I solve things using method of joints, but it's very rare, and I tend not to do that. Okay, so now we're going to zero redundant or zero force members. Okay, sometimes trusses will have members that don't take any load. This could be either to prevent buckling or because they take load under different load configurations. So for example, when the wind blows a different way, or <clears throat> when you're working in rail, every bridge has to be designed for what if the train hits it. Um, so it might not be applied most of the time, but it might be there for a what if circumstance. There are two ways to identify ZFMs or zero force members. Case one. If there are two non-collinear members that meet in an unloaded joint, then both are zero force members. Now that's a clear sentence, but it's one of those things where if you want to be accurate and you want to be correct, you have to use really um, difficult words. What that means is if I have two members that are non-collinear, collinear means the two members are in the straight line, right? So if I have two members that join and they're not in a straight line, any two members that are not in a straight line, if they meet, and there's no force. If I apply a force, not a zero force member, but if there's no force on the corner of a, a, a truss, so even if we go back to our Warren truss, I will just draw a Warren truss here. Let's say I had the load was like that, right? In that situation, even if I apply a load here, I have two members, they're not collinear, Right, they're not in a straight line. Two members that meet and there's no force being applied on that corner, then this has to be zero and this has to be zero. And this can actually even happen like a zipper because let's say the force is being applied here and I have this big long crane thing sticking out here. Well, if this is zero and that's zero, well now this is zero and that's zero and then this is zero and that's zero. 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 Yeah? Okay. So that's the first method. The second situation, and we see this in our prep truss. Let's go with the shortest possible. Um, no, we're good. I want it to be symmetrical. Okay, so here, the other condition, when three members meet at an unloaded joint where two are collinear, then the third is a zero force member. So in this location here, if I zoom in on this, so what I like to do is I like to draw a magnifying glass. I'm gonna zoom in on that location. What does that look like? Does that look like that? You're happy with that? You've understood what I've drawn there? Okay, let's call this Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Yeah, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Alice and Charlie, they're collinear. They're on the same line. So that means that there's no force being applied. If there's, let's say on this side here, there's something you know being loaded on there. Right, I, I don't know. Uh, Okay, it's some, some force being applied. If some force is being applied, in that case, it's not a zero force member. But here, Bob has to be zero. Now, let me explain that. In terms of, when we use method of joints, what we're saying is we're just doing a vector, we're doing the vector with all the forces that are acting on the joint. What we say is that all the joints, every part of the joint has to be in equilibrium 
Otherwise, if any joint is not in equilibrium, the joint will explode, right? And if it explodes, it's gonna be moving, and if it's moving, it's broken, right? So every joint has to be in equilibrium. So what that means is if I push, if Bob pushes even a little bit, if Bob has one Newton of force, it's gonna push down. Who's gonna push up? Alice isn't gonna push up, because Alice is horizontal. Charlie's not gonna push up, because Charlie's horizontal. So who can push up? Nobody. So if nobody can push up, Alice, sorry, Bob is not allowed to have any force. Bob has to equal zero. Because if Bob has one Newton, the thing will, the thing will break. Yeah, because it will push and nothing will push back. Okay? Now, in this situation, let's say there's 100 Newtons being applied. Now, Bob does have to do something. Bob, in order to counteract this 100 Newtons down, we have to have 100 Newtons up. So, I want to put a stress. A zero force member can never have a force being applied to it. If you have a force being applied to any point, now that's the time when it does something. Right? So a zero force member has to be unloaded. If there's two members, they have to be non-collinear. If there's three, I always think of straight line angles, right? The, the mathematical proof that we use, straight line angles. This one will be zero, those two will be zero. That's how we talk about um, zero force members. Now I have a video where I talk about that. Let's see how long my video is. Um, if you can click on that for me. Okay. Oh, 40 minutes. Okay, if you want to learn, spend 40 minutes going on, on about zero force members, that's a resource for you. Can you close that? Okay, next. Uh, not all trusses are statically determinate. This means you can't solve them. Um, <clears throat> I have something that explains what that means. Can you then click on this one below? I don't know what that is. So. I, um, this is a rule that people use. I don't need to, don't think you need to worry about it in high, at high school, but the idea is that the members plus the reaction, so the number of members plus the number of reactions has to equal to twice the number of joints. That's a rule. If it's not, can't be statically, it's not, can't be solved. Can't be solved at high school or first year uni. Um, okay, close and then go back. Yeah, okay. Uh, types of trusses, we talked about that. Other videos on trusses, got a whole bunch of, there we go. Okay, so we're done. Uh, we can, you know, um, thanks.